Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio General Class, session number 17. During our previous session, we had a question pool review. We discussed band propagation and the sun's rotation. We also looked at SIDs or SIDs or sudden ionic disturbances due to solar flares. We also discussed coronal holes and coronal mass ejections, also called CMEs. We looked at geomag geomagnetic storms. We also discussed two indices, the K index and the A index. We also looked at the maximum usable frequency or MUF and the matching lowest usable frequency, or LUF. We also talked about beacons and how that could be used to determine what the MUF is. We also discussed short path and long path propagation and the echo effect as a result. And we also talked about what determines the maximum height of the ionosphere or where it actually is located. And then in respect of the ionosphere, we spoke about several layers, the F2 region, the E region, and then we ended with the D region. So this is where we are in respect of our overall curriculum. We will be wrapping up radio wave propagation today with a few slides when we come back from the question pool review and we'll continue into theory on the next topic, which will be amateur radio practices. As always, we encourage students to keep attempting the practice tests. And again, congrats to all of the persons who would have sat the technician past and have gotten your US call sign and in Trinidad and Tobago persons who have applied for their local Trinidad and Tobago call sign and elsewhere in the Caribbean and wherever you are, congrats on your successes. We had no outstanding questions from the last session. So we now proceed to go straight into our question pool. So we know how that goes. We go to our no nonsense guide. All right. So for persons who are following along with the PDF version of the no nonsense guide, we are on page 50. Again, if you are using the printed copy, you may need to adjust the page number accordingly. So again, we will go through very quickly the questions in the question pool because we dealt with all of the theories. We had the slides in the slide deck last session where we discussed each and every one of these topics and questions in the question pool. So our first question, what causes HF propagation conditions to vary periodically in a roughly 28-day cycle. So they're asking what affects HF propagation in a cycle spanning 28 days. So last class, we said that the sun rotates on its axis in about 20 days' time. So that is what they're looking for. The answer is the sun's rotation on its axis. And as we have learned, we need to pay very close attention to the sun as amateur radio operators. So our next question in the question pool. Approximately how long does it take the increased ultraviolet or UV and X-ray radiation from solar flares to affect radio propagation on Earth? What they're basically asking us here is how long does a solar flare arrive, take to arrive on the Earth? Or rather, how long does the UV light and the X-rays associated with the solar flares, how long does that, when it's ejected from the sun, how long does it take to go from the sun to the earth? Again, last class, we learned that it travels at the speed of light, and therefore it takes approximately eight minutes to get here. All right, so that's solar flares and the X-rays and UV rays associated with it. Okay, next question in the question pool. What effect does a sudden ionospheric disturbance 
have on the daytime ionospheric propagation of HF radio waves. So we learned when we have a SID, the way that it affects the HF propagation on daytime transmissions is that it disrupts the signals on lower frequencies more than those on higher frequencies. So that's our answer. Next question in the question pool. How are radio communications usually affected by the charged particles that reach Earth from solar coronal holes? So let's dissect this question a bit. What they're asking us, how is the radio communication affected from coronal holes? So when you have coronal holes, you have charged particles that leave the sun, they come and they cause a disturbance. So that's the answer. HF communications are disturbed. Next, how long does it take charged particles from coronal mass ejections or CMEs to affect radio propagation on Earth? So remember, those charged particles, they are not traveling at the speed of light, like the X-rays and the UVs that took eight minutes. They are traveling much more slowly. And as we learned in our last session, those charged particles take anywhere between 20 hours to 40 hours to arrive from the sun to the earth. So those are the CMEs or coronal mass ejections or coronal holes. Those charged particles take that long to traverse space to get to the earth from the sun. Next question. What is a geomagnetic storm? So we had said that the earth does have its magnetic field. And sometimes the solar, solar wind will affect the magnetic field and that causes a temporary disturbance in the Earth's magnetosphere. So when you have a geomagnetic, geomagnetic storm, it's a temporary disturbance in the Earth's magnetosphere or the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, all right, next question. Which of the following effects can a geomagnetic storm have on radio propagation? So we showed a slide on that and we said that it can result in degraded high latitude HF propagation. So again, remember the Earth, we have longitude and latitude. So high latitude, uh, lines of latitude um, that describe the location on Earth. So we're looking at high latitude HF propagation. It's degraded when you have geomag geomagnetic storms. Next up, what benefit can high geomagnetic activity have on radio communications? So while we said in the last or the previous question that such activity can degrade high latitude HF propagation, guess what? you can have a benefit and that's what they're asking us about. So remember that slide? We said there's a benefit when you have those geomagnetic storms. We said auroras form and those can reflect VHF signals. So remember we keep saying during the technician class and a bit during our general class that as hams, as amateur radio operators, we love to bounce our signals off of stuff. So we have to, you know, look at something to bounce our radio signals off of and auroras. We can have auroral reflection where we reflect our VHF signals. That's the part of the band that we can use and send our signal to the auroras and bounce it off and reach another radio amateur, radio, amateur, radio amateur operator somewhere else around the globe through that reflection. Our next question in the question pool. What does the K index indicate? So remember we talked about two indices before, so we need to know the K index refers to the short term stability of the Earth's magnetic field. So K index is short term stability. Next question, and you probably guessed this is what was coming up next. They're asking us, what does the A index indicate? Well, if the K index is the short term stability, then the A index is the long-term stability of the Earth's geomagnetic field. So very similar questions, and we just need to learn that K index is short-term, A index is long-term.
Okay, next question in the question pool. What does MUF stand for? So we learned the acronym last class that MUF stands for the maximum usable frequency for communications between two points. That's the maximum frequency if you have to communicate between two points and it as an amateur radio operator using your HF spectrum. That's the maximum frequency you could use. Anything above that, you will not be successful. So maximum. You probably guessed what the next question would be. What does the LUF stand for? Well, if the MUF is the maximum usable frequency, the LUF is the lowest usable frequency for communications between two points. In other words, if you use a frequency below the lowest usable, you will not be successful as an amateur radio operator in communicating with another radio operator because your frequency is below the lowest usable. Next question in the question pool. What factors affect the MUF, the maximum usable frequencies? And we need to learn, we did a slide on this. All of these uh, options are quite correct. These are the factors we learned. The part distance and location, meaning how far away from and where are the two amateur radio operators. The time of the day, is it morning, is it during the afternoon period, is it at night? And the season, meaning what time of year. And of course, we talked about the sun being important to amateur radio operators. So the solar radiation and also any ionospheric disturbances that would occur. Let's continue with more questions in the question pool. What usually happens to radio waves with frequencies below the MUF and above the LUF when they are sent into the ionosphere? So let's dissect this question a bit. So they're asking us what happens to radio waves when the frequency is below the MUF and above the LUF, okay? So basically, remember that little formula we showed that the frequency for propagation to occur, it has to be between these two. So they're telling us that the frequency is actually between the MUF and the LUF. So it's higher than the lowest and it's below the maximum. So therefore you are well within your range. What happens when you transmit on a frequency below the MUF and above the LUF and you send it to the ionosphere? Well, the ionosphere does exactly what we would like it to do as hams. It will bounce it back to Earth. So the, question, the answer is those frequencies are bent back to Earth. So that's how we communicate. That's how the radio frequency propagates. And that's how as hams we communicate. We are depending on the ionosphere to bounce our signals so it returns back to Earth. Once it's below the MUF and above the LUF. That is your sweet spot. Okay. Next question, what usually happens to radio waves with frequencies below the LUF? So if you are below the lowest usable frequency, that tells you it's not gonna work, right? But what actually happens to it? Those frequencies are actually completely absorbed by the ionosphere. It absorbs it, it's like a sponge. It takes the signal and holds it and doesn't send it back to Earth. That's not what you want as a ham. You want to bounce your signal. So if you choose a frequency below the F, LUF, you will not be successful because it is absorbed and it's not bounced, it's not reflected, it's not refracted. It goes and stays. Okay, next question in the question pool. What happens to HF propagation when the LUF exceeds the MUF? Wow, yes, uh, that can happen. Hopefully it doesn't happen too often. But if your lowest usable exceeds your maximum usable, no dice. It means no HF radio frequency will support ordinary skywave communications over the path. That means you will have no ionospheric propagation. That's what they mean by the skywave communication. Skywave depends on the ionosphere to bounce your signal off of. And if you are above the LUF or the LUF exceeds your MUF, that means there's no usable frequency. So that's why the answer is no HF radio frequency will support ordinary skywave communications over that path. Okay, next question. 
Which of the following applies when selecting a frequency for lowest attenuation when transmitting on HF? So what they're asking us is if we are transmitting on HF and we want to select a frequency for the lowest attenuation. Remember we said attenuation is reduction. So we want to use a frequency that has the least amount of signal reduction. We want most of our signals to get there. So we want to be effective, we want to be efficient. So what frequency shall we use or select? We select a frequency that is just below the maximum usable frequency. So whatever the maximum is, we tune our dial to a frequency just below it and we will have the maximum signal because that is the frequency with the lowest attenuation or the lowest reduction in the signal. All right, so all of this theory is supposed to help us be better amateur radio operators. Apart from us sitting the exam and getting our ticket, the knowledge of this should help us be successful as amateur radio operators. Okay, continuing. What is a reliable way to determine if the maximum usable frequency is high enough to support skip propagation between your station and a distant location on frequencies below between 14 and 30 megahertz? Long-winded questions. Hmm. Let's dissect this one a little bit. They're asking us about a reliable way. How do we determine if the MUF the maximum usable frequency is high enough to support skip propagation. What is skip propagation? Well, that is hams using the sky wave. We are bouncing our signal off of the ionosphere to get to another part of the Earth. That is skip propagation. We are sick. The signal is literally hopping and skipping. Uh, it's going up into the sky in the ionosphere and it's going at a distance. So that's the skip. Between your station, so that's you as an amateur radio operator, and the other amateur radio operator at some distant location. But they're asking us about frequencies between 14 and 30 megahertz. Last, our last session, we talked about beacons. So what we do to determine if it will work is we listen for signals from an international beacon in the frequency range you plan to use. So if you listen to that beacon, which is a transmitter that is sending out a signal periodically, and you hear that, that means, guess what? Yes, that frequency will support propagation. So that's how you determine. Listen to the beacon. Next question. What is a characteristic of skywave signals arriving at your location by both short path and long path propagation? So let's dissect this question a little bit. They're asking us about a characteristic. What will you observe? If your sky wave signal, so that means you know you're transmitting on HF and it's going to the ionosphere to be bounced to another location on the Earth, but it's going by both the short part. Remember, we showed that a signal could leave and get to a destination on the Earth's surface using the short way around but it can also get to that same destination using the long way around. So that is called short path and long path propagation. What if your signal gets to the receiver, both long path and short path? How will you know, how will that receiver know it came via both? What they will hear is likely a slightly delayed echo. So that is what they might hear. And they can conclude that the signal, your signal, got to them via both short path and long path. Okay, continuing. Next question in the question pool. Where on earth do ionospheric layers reach their maximum height? So we had a slide that shows that where the sun is overhead is where the ionosphere will be the highest because it's the sun that ionizes those layers. Next question. Why is the F2 region mainly responsible for the longest distance radio wave propagations? So remember, we had the D layer, the E layer, and the F layer, and sometimes the F layer is in two, the F1 and F2, and we had it in that order of height. Well, the F2 layer, of course, is the highest region, and therefore, if it's the highest, we showed a diagram that showed that because our signal is bouncing off of the highest layer, it travels the farthest. And that is the answer. 
because it is the highest ionospheric region. That's why the F2 causes your signal to go very far. Now, our next question will tell you just how far it can go. What is the approximate maximum distance along the Earth's surface that is normally covered in one hop using the F2 region? Let's dissect this question a little bit. So they're asking us maximum distance that will normally be covered in one hop when our signal bounces off of the F2 region. Remember the F2 region we just discussed is the highest. It's going to get, get, get us the farthest propagation. And they're saying one hop because as we also discussed last class, our signal can bounce off of the ionosphere when it leaves our antenna and go down to Earth and bounce again off of the Earth back onto the ionosphere and bounce again. It can hop and skip. And uh, that's how our signal can travel very, very far. But one hop, there's a maximum distance when our signal leaves our antenna and bounces off the ionosphere. That maximum distance is 2,500 miles. Okay. So when we did the slides in the slide deck, we had converted to kilometers for persons who just wanted a reference, but our exams are in imperial units and therefore we need to know the answer in miles. Next question. What is the approximate maximum distance along the Earth's surface that is normally covered in one hop using the E region? All right, so we have the D, E, and F region. So the E region is a little lower. And we said the E region because it's a little bit lower when we bounce our signals or the signal is bounced off of the E region, it will not go as far as if it was bounced off of the F. But how far does it actually go? The answer is 1,200 miles. Okay, moving right along. Next question in the question pool. Which ionospheric layer is closest to the Earth's surface? So we said we had the D layer, the E layer, the F layer, and so on. So the D is the lowest, therefore it's the closest. And that's the answer, the D layer. Next question. Which ionospheric layer is the most absorbent of long skip signals during daylight hours on frequencies below 10 megahertz? So let's dissect this question a little bit. So they're asking us for the ionospheric layer. So we know it's either D, E, F, right? But they're asking us which one is most absorbent. So you may remember last class, we talked about the D layer being absorbent. And it absorbs, during the daylight, frequencies below 10 megahertz. And we said that's why any frequency below 10 megahertz, we have difficulty, great difficulty, um, almost impossible to communicate using sky waves because that D layer is going to absorb those frequencies. And remember we said that the D layer rarely exists mainly during the daylight hours or daytime when the sun is there. That sun creates that delay and stops propagation of signals below 10 megahertz. So you see how useful this theory can help you as an amateur radio operator to know what frequency to use, whether it's regular uh, chit-chat that you'd like to have with another ham, or QSO as we call it, or whether you're passing emergency traffic. You need to know, we need to know, what frequency should be used as a ham? You can't just go on, let me just dial up any old frequency. No, you must know, and this is where all of this theory comes in. Okay, last question before we go into a little theory. All right. Why is long distance communication, communication on the 40 meter, 60 meter, 80 meter, and 160 meter bands more difficult during the day? Well, we actually just said it. Um, it's just the question is put in terms of, remember we said we can give a frequency in terms of the actual frequency in megahertz, kilohertz, gigahertz, and so on. We can also give that same frequency reference in terms of the wavelength of the frequency by saying what meter band it is, or centimeter, or whatever, the wavelength, yes? So it's the same question they're asking us in a different way. So. Why is that long distance communication difficult for those frequencies during the day? It's because of Mr. D layer. It destroys, the D layer destroys that frequency, so to speak, right? If you want a way to remember it, D for destroy. The D layer absorbs signals at these frequencies during daylight hours. Again, another spin on the same, the question just before it. So let's do a, little bit, a couple of slides in the slide deck before we go to the break, yes. 
Okay. So we are back to our slide deck. So continuing along, radio wave propagation, the topic, we need to be aware as hams about the concept of the critical angle. Now on our little diagram on the right hand side, you will see that we have our transmitter, this is our ham, we have our antenna, and our signal is leaving our antenna and going up into the sky, it's going to the ionosphere, and of course, hams, we love to bounce signals off of things, so we're bouncing it off of the ionosphere, and it's coming back down to Earth, and therefore, we want to communicate with someone on Earth at a long distance. But there's the concept of critical angle. If the, transmit, the transmission, the signal, leaves our antenna and goes up to the sky and the ionosphere at this angle, all right, it comes down and it's dropped onto it. It's refracted through the ionosphere. If it's at this angle, it's refracted and it comes down to the earth. If it's at this angle, notice a lower angle, it's refracted and so on, right? Or reflected if you want to use that term, or bounced, yes. But notice there is an angle, this one, I think it is, yes, this one, when we transmit that signal at this angle, a very high angle, a high takeoff angle for the signal, notice it goes through the ionosphere and it's not refracted, it's not reflected, it's not bounced at all. It goes, what, straight through? Yes, it's lost into space. That angle at which that starts to happen is called the critical angle. So angles below, so you're looking at the horizon, it's bouncing. You look a little further up, elevation, it bounces. Go a little further up, it bounces. But up, up and away, you start to look higher and higher. Your signal doesn't bounce anymore. You let that signal go in this direction, it's going to go straight through the atmosphere, not refracted, and so on and so on. So this angle at which it starts to um, that property that we're seeing here is called the critical angle. So we say the critical angle refers to, a when we're talking about radio wave propagation, is the highest takeoff angle that will return a radio wave to Earth under specific ionospheric conditions. So whatever that highest angle is, this angle, let's say that angle is, let's say, I don't know, 45 degrees or 60 degrees, whatever that angle is, that's the highest angle that will cause it. So on our right hand side, we also try to show it here. Notice that the signal is leaving the Earth, going to the atmosphere and bouncing successfully, that's fine. It's leaving the Earth successfully and bouncing. But notice frequencies higher than that, or sorry, angles higher than that. It doesn't bounce, it goes straight through. So this angle here, that is the maximum angle that will support the signal bouncing, that angle is called the critical angle. And you need to know this for your exam. So just FYI, frequencies greater than the criti critical angle are too steep. Therefore, will not be refracted and instead will pass straight through the ionosphere. All right, so this is our critical angle. So let's take a break at this point and we'll come back to continue with our theory. So folks, take a stretch, have a bathroom break, Get a little drink of water and we'll meet you back in a couple of minutes time.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. So, Jermaine posted a question, a really good question. How do you communicate with a station that is less than one hop? And that's an excellent question because if at, as hams we could only communicate with a station that is one hop or more away, 1,200 miles or 2,500 miles, what about people that are closer to us? All right, so upcoming, we have a couple of slides that will talk about communicating within the skip zone or distances that are closer than that hop. All right, so we'll deal with that shortly. Excellent question. Okay, so let's talk about what the skip zone is, sometimes called the dead zone. Some will call it that. But what is the skip zone? And Jermaine already realized that there, there is a dead zone. But let's discuss a little bit about what the skip zone is. So if we were to look at our diagram on the right hand side here, we're seeing that this is our location. We have our transmitter, our amateur radio transceiver connected to our antenna and our signal is leaving. But our signal, we said you can go via the ground wave, but it doesn't get very far, right? So there's a ground wave propagation. You also have tropospheric propagation. You have ionospheric propagation. You have all different types of propagation, but the ground wave will just get that far. So a ham is close to another ham, and the ground wave will get there and they can communicate. But as hams on HF, we depend on the sky wave propagation. So it goes up to the ionosphere. But we did say that depending on the region, the E layer, the F layer is 1,200 miles, 2,500 miles. So that distance between where the ground wave stops and where the ionospheric propagation starts, that is called the skip zone, where you have no signal. So if a ham is in this location here, he gets no signal, she gets no signal because they are in the skip zone. The ground wave doesn't reach them, it only reaches this far, and the sky wave bypasses them, it goes over their head literally, and doesn't drop uh, close enough. So that is actually the basis of Jermaine's question. How do we communicate with hams in the skip zone? Well, we will see very shortly just exactly what techniques we use uh, to do so. That's why I felt that was a very good question here, Jermaine. So we say that uh, the skip zone is the region where a radio transmission cannot usually be received via the ground wave or the sky wave. So this just simply means you cannot talk to a ham uh, in the, if they're in this location using the ground wave or sky wave. But we have some techniques to still communicate within the skip zone as we'll see in a short while. And the skip zone occurs in the region between the point where the ground wave signal can no longer be heard, that's this point here, and the point where the sky wave first returns to Earth, that's this point here. So this area is called the skip zone or the dead zone. All right. But what can we do about it? Well, there's one form of propagation that helps us communicate with an amateur radio operator that is in our skip zone, where they would not normally be heard via the ground wave, as well as the sky wave. And that is where scatter propagation comes in. And by the way, no, if you're thinking scatter, it has nothing to do with food, all the TNT residents will know about that quip. It's relating to our technique that we can use to communicate with another ham in the skip zone. It's called scatter propagation. So again, this is our source. This is the amateur radio operator here and wishes to communicate with another amateur radio operator located here on the earth. But that person is not located. It's far away from the ground wave that will normally um, go out from the station. So the ground wave probably stops about here. It doesn't go any further. And the sky wave goes right over the person's head and bounces much further. Doesn't get to them. They're in the skip zone. But there's something called scatter propagation that exists. And if we will look at the diagram here, we will see that this signal comes back via the ionosphere and returns to the station, even though the main signal did not reach them. The backscatter or the scatter propagation actually gets to them. So it's a kind of reflection again in the opposite direction. So the signal goes from the transmitter in one direction 
and then there is a scatter propagation that can occur and there are of course issues with it but the point is using scatter propagation it is possible to communicate with a station that is not normally uh, you're not normally able to communicate because of the possibility of scatter it can happen so it's a little bit hit, hit or miss and there are times and other conditions under which it can occur but it is possible that's one technique we'll come to another technique shortly we actually discussed it before but we'll go into it a little further so let's just deal with the theory here and what you need to know for the exam so we say in scatter propagation a small amount of the transmission right small amount is reflected back in the direction of the transmitting station and the signal is heard in the transmitting station's skip zone, a place that uh, would not that person will normally not copy or hear um, the transmitter. So this station B here would not normally hear station A because it's further than the ground wave, and it's um, the the sky wave is dropping too far. So it's in the skip zone. But through scatter propagation, that small amount of transmission that is reflected back in the opposite direction, that scatter. Uh, propagation or that scatter transmission gets to the station and they hear the original station's transmission. But, there's a but, there's a however, there's a oh boy oh boy, it's not ideal. Such signals are usually weak as only a small part of the energy is scattered into the skip zone. So that's a disadvantage. You will communicate but it may be a very weak communication. But at least it's some communication better than nothing also for the exam you need to know hf scatter transmissions are usually characterized as having a wavering sound so the sound is not steady at all it's kind of coming and going very wavering right so the quality is not of the best so you're communicating but it's weak it's wavering but at least you're communicating such signals often sound distorted as the energy is scattered into the skip zone through several different radio wave paths. So we saw here how we have more than one signal arriving through the scatter. Well, that causes distortion as well. So you might say, wow, those are a lot of disadvantage. Yes, but remember, this is a zone, the skip zone, where our signal would not normally reach, but it's reaching through that propagation called scatter propagation. So it works. But there are some issues, and these are the points here that you need to know for your exam about scatter propagation that occurs, that allows a ham to talk to another amateur radio operator or be heard by another amateur radio operator in what is their normally their skip zone or their dead zone where they are not normally heard. Okay, so to again answer Jermaine's question, we now come to Envis. Now, this is not the first time you'll be hearing about Envis. We discussed Envis, those of us who were in the technician class. And during our general class sessions, we also discussed Envis. And we learned that Envis meant near vertical incidence sky wave. And it's a technique. We saw how we can construct an Envis antenna last couple of classes, yes? But the technique is what actually allows us to be able to... Uh, communicate in a region that we probably would not normally be able to communicate with, right? So to answer Jermaine's question, that's another technique that is used. Um, if your sky wave is going over the person's head, you can use Envis. So this is the sky wave that would normally go up, bounces or refracts off of the ionosphere and comes back much further, that $2,500 hop distance, right? But we want to communicate with somebody nearby, so it's probably too far away for the ground wave to get there so we're depending still on sky wave but we use the envis technique remember we said we constructed antennas in such a way that we try to have that signal go at a very high angle the problem with that is that it doesn't work for all frequencies so that's why on the right hand side here we have a range of frequencies that the envis technique can work in very low frequencies or we say mf medium frequencies hf high frequencies if you remember, HF is between 3 and 30 megahertz, but it doesn't work on all of the HF frequencies. These specific ones, the 40 meter band, the 80 meter band, and the 160 meter band, which is medium frequency and high frequencies. Envis technique does not work uh, on frequencies that are higher than these. So you also have to use it with the 
relevant frequency for the technique to work. But that is how you can communicate. And we said that's a very powerful technique that hams have, especially for MCOMs or emergency communications. And we see right here, for instance, imagine you have an amateur radio operator located in a valley and wants to communicate to other hams in other valleys. Well, through ground wave, it's not going to get there. <laughs> There's no way it's going to get there through ground wave propagation. And through normal ionospheric propagation, it may go too far. But through ENVIS, when we send our signal at such a high angle, it will bounce short. It wouldn't bounce long. And we can talk to that person in the valley. And that's actually what hams use in emergencies when we have disaster situations. We have ENVIS as part of our go-kit. We set up our ENVIS antenna and we can communicate short range. But notice that the frequencies that you can use it on, uh, it's not every frequency. It's MF and HF. And this is the point that you will get in the exam that ENVIS propagation allows for short distance but it must be MF, which is medium frequency, or HF, high frequency propagation, using high elevation angles. So we learned about what ENVIS is, a high elevation angle that the signal must go to be able to come back down to drop short. Because if we use the normal type of antennas with a lower angle of radiation, guess what? It's going to bounce back much further along the Earth. So, Jermaine, to answer your question, uh, scatter propagation and ENVIS are two techniques that HAMS use to talk to HAMS other hams in the region that uh, will be their skip zone or they will not normally be able to. So, we now uh, come on to the next topic, which is amateur radio practices. So, we have just completed the previous topic, radio wave propagation. So, we have a couple of slides. Uh, let's see if we can, uh, we might go a little over today, folks. Um, I want to see if we can finish these slides. So, let's bear with us. Let's go. So, our HF transceivers, those are our radios or receivers. We have some features on radios as hams that we use to reduce interference because we can encounter a lot of interference as amateur radio operators. And one of those features or knobs or buttons or pieces of hardware inside of a radio is called the notch filter. So, it is found on many HF transceivers. Uh, it can be a button, it can be a switch, it can be something that you plug into the radio, but it's a notch filter. And what that essentially does is it reduces the interference by blocking that particular interference signal. So if we look at the graph here, you will see that the notch filter just drops off this interfering part and continues to receive everything else. It's kind of ignoring part of the signal. You know, we have a say, talk to the hand. That's kind of what we're doing here. We're listening to everything else, but we're ignoring that little piece that is the interference. We don't really want to hear it. We're ignoring it, and our notch filters notches out that interference. So we say a notch filter that is found in many HF transceivers is used to reduce interference from carriers in the receiver passband by blocking the interfering signal. So any of that interference in the passband is notched out. So it's called a notch filter. Yet another feature. So these are all features in radios. And the better the radio, the more of these features they tend to have and the better the quality of these features. Another one is called the IF shift control. And IF there, as we, we recall from our previous classes, not the word if. <laughs> it means intermediate frequency. So the IF shift control is another feature that we have. And if we looked at the bottom of our, uh, the bottom diagram here, we will see that we have a target signal. This is the signal that we're trying to receive. And the dotted line here, right, is where we would normally be receiving. But notice the dotted line here also includes this bit of signal here that we don't want to hear. This is interference, this sort of, what is it, turquoise looking color. That's interference. But our receive, this part here is the frequency we're receiving, our target signal. And of course, we receive a little left and to the right of it. and part of what we are hearing is interference. So we use, <coughs> excuse me, our IF shift control and shift to the left. All right, we move to the left, yes, okay. And notice how uh, we are now avoiding this bit of interference. We have shifted to the left. Instead of this dotted line here, we have shifted to the left. Now, we are still within the target signal. This is our target signal here that we're trying to, reach, we're trying to receive. So we are still able to receive it. But notice that here we are. We have just avoided this interference. So that IF shift control allows us to shift this 
where the interference is avoided, but the target signal is still within our receiver's range. So that is the IF shift control. On a receiver, it is used to avoid interference from stations that are very close to the receive frequency by shifting the pass band of the IF filter to the left or the right. It doesn't have to be left alone. Just in our um, diagram here, we showed we shifted left. Left or right of the center frequency. So we shifted it this way, and it's just a little to the left of the frequency that we wish to listen to. There's no interference inside of there at all. Our interference is avoided. So that's the IF shift control. There's one more feature as well on our radios. Sometimes it's a button, it's a switch. Uh, you turn it on, you turn it off. Uh, sometimes you can vary it. It's called the attenuator. And we may recall from our previous sessions, we talked about attenuators, attenuation. And we said whenever we hear the word attenuate or attenuator, that is reduction. We reduce something. All right, so think of an attenuator. Uh, your tap, when you close um, your tap, and the water stops or it loses the water you know, from coming through the pipe, that is your attenuating, you're reducing, all right? So your attenuator here is a feature on your radio and it is used to uh, sort of um, push back against signal overload. So if you have a strong signal that is coming in uh, from a nearby receiver, it may overload your front end of your radio, uh, that stage of your radio, and therefore uh, that's strong signal may cause you to be very poorly receiving other signals as well. So one way to attenuate or reduce that strong signal that may be affecting your reception is uh, to use the attenuator on your radio. So we say that an attenuator is used to reduce signal overload that occurs when receiving overly strong incoming signals. So if there's a very strong signal and it's too strong, that's overload, right? It's just like having too much uh, water pressure. Uh, see flooding, that's too much water. Too much of anything is probably sometimes good for nothing. So use your attenuator uh, to reduce that signal, right? So just another point about the IF shift control. Uh, one of the ways I think of an IF shift control those of us who are drivers, you know, sometimes you're driving and the sun is directly overhead. It's a uh, glare and you can't see directly in front of you. So uh, what do you do? Sometimes you glance a little way uh, directly. Instead of looking directly in front of you, glance just a little to the right or to the left. Uh, you can still see sufficiently to drive, but you are not facing that uh, very bright sun in your face, right? So you can think of the air shift control like that. You're just shifting your gaze a little bit so that the thing that is interfering, something you're not interested in, you can avoid it. And that's the way the IF shift control works. So we have some more features on our transceivers, our radios. One is called the noise blanker and the other one is called noise reduction. So if we think of this signal here as what our radio receiving, but sometimes we have sources of noise, especially on the HF bands. You have atmospheric noise, you have noise from things like LED lights, LED bulbs, uh, your car engine, the alternator can carry a tick, 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 tick sort of noise, you know. Um, there's hum, there's hiss, uh, the ignition noise, power line noise, um, uh, what we call heterodynes, all sorts of noise that may occur and you are hearing this squeal or tick or pop or hiss, whatever it is, and it's irritating you and you're not hearing sufficient of the signal, the, uh, let's say it's amateur radio operator is talking to you and you're not hearing that, you're not hearing her clearly enough or loud enough, but you're hearing all this set of interference, this noise. So if these noises are pulsing like that, we have a feature, a button, a switch, um, that you can turn on, it's called a noise blanker. And how the noise blanker works, so notice this is our signal that we are trying to receive, right? This is, let's say, our amateur radio operator friend that is talking with us and we are trying to listen to that, but you have these pop, 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 tick, 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 that sort of noise that's inter interrupting, so it's periodic, it's a sort of pulsing noise. You don't wanna hear that, but when you turn on your noise blanker, your noise blanker is going to reduce the gain during that point of the pulse. So you will hear the intended signal, but when it pulses like that, it blanks it off, just for that little moment in time, and then you hear the signal that you want again, and when that interference comes, it, uh, you know, talk to the hand, it ignores it. And then the piece that you want to hear again, your radio lets you hear that part, and then it blanks off the little 
noise again. So it seems as though the noise isn't there anymore. But what it's doing is actually reducing the receiver gain. So it doesn't, you don't actually hear it. And it seems as though all you're hearing is mostly your intended signal, that voice of the person that you're talking to, you're hearing their voice. And it works like magic, noise blanker. But a noise blanker works to reduce pulsing types of noise, such as ignition noise from a car, by reducing the receiver gain during a pulse. So it doesn't receive it, it doesn't reduce it all the time, just during that interference, it, re it reduces it for you so that it's almost as though it's not there. Looks like magic. And this is what you need to know for your exam. That's what a noise blanker does, and this is how it works. Noise reduction is another one. It uses DSP or digital signal, signal processing techniques to reduce other types of noise. But the problem with DSPs, and you can have a button or switch to turn on the DSP or the noise reduction, but it can cause the receive signal to become very distorted. So there's that bit of disadvantage. But guess what? You may at least be removing that set of noise in your head and you will be hearing the person. It's just that the signal might sound a little bit distorted, but you should be able to hear them. So these are two other features in your radio. Let's barrel through again. For CW or Morse code operations, we need to know that built into your transceiver, there's a feature called an electronic keyer. So it will actually generate the tones necessary for the CW operation, or really the dits and dars, or the dots and dashes, according to the example for CW Morse code. So the electronic key is that feature in your radio that will uh, provide the automatic generation of the string of dots and dashes, right? So we have the dots and dashes that makes up Morse code, or we call the dits and the dars. Uh, for Morse code or CW operation. So you need to know that for the exam. It's called an electronic keyer that generates those dits and dars or dots and dashes. Now it's also possible when you're listening to Morse code to reduce the interference. If you're on upper sideband when you're doing Morse code, you can switch to lower sideband and that could actually reduce the interference, which is the next point, bullet point that we have here. It may be possible to reduce or eliminate interference from other signals when receiving CW or Morse code uh, signals on a typical HF transceiver by selecting the opposite or reverse sideband, thus shifting the receiver's passband up or down so that the interfering signals can no longer be heard. So you are doing CW, you're on sideband, all of a sudden you start to hear interference, you can just simply switch or reverse or go to lower sideband if you want upper sideband and the, signal, the interference signal might be reduced and you're still here in your CW. So you need to know these points for the exam. Moving right along. As HAMS, we have techniques when we are DXing or having long distance exchange or we are having a conversation or QSO as we will call it uh, with foreign amateur radio operators, persons that are very long distance, long geographic distance from us, what we call DX operation. Uh, that operation that is used when we are having those types of long distance exchanges, especially if we have what you call a pile up, a lot of stations are trying to get, let's say a rare DX station, you hardly hear them up. And when they come up, a ton of people are trying to talk with them. So they tend to operate what you call split mode or the operating split. <coughs> what is split? Well, that station, the foreign station, they actually transmit on one frequency and listen on another frequency or receive on another frequency. So that is called split mode operation on HF. So for example, the foreign station might be listening on 14.250, uh, sorry, they're transmitting on 14.250, they'll say, okay, calling CQ, calling CQ. But when you answer them, you have to respond to them on 14.255. You don't transmit on the same frequency that they transmitted on. And the reason for that, or they try to do that is, imagine if that DX station transmits on 14.250 and says, calling CQ, any stations, listening and would like to talk. That's what calling CQ is. Well, what can happen is that 200 uh, DX stations or foreign stations could try to reply. And, <laughs> you know, the foreign station may hear one of them and reply. But if that station is replying to that one and everybody's replying on the same frequency, then nobody may actually hear what that foreign station says. So the foreign station is transmitting on one frequency but listening on the other. So when you're talking with them, you transmit on what they're listening to and they will hear what they wish and then they transmit so that when they're transmitting, everybody can hear what that foreign station is saying. 
So if it were other way around and everybody else is talking, a lot of people wouldn't hear what that foreign station is saying. So they operate uh, split mode, um, especially uh, foreign rare DX stations that working a pileup, as we call it, which is many persons trying to talk to them at one time, they operate in split mode. So we say operating an HF transceiver in split mode means to set different transmit and receive frequencies. And we just gave a reason why that is done. Uh, we just, um, not for the exam, but just to let you know what a VFO is, uh, we had discussed it at a previous session, but uh, because we have a point about VFO, a dual VFO, we just need to remind ourselves what a VFO is. It's a variable frequency oscillator, and it is used to tune the radio to the intended frequency of operation. So basically, that is your tuning dial. That's what your VFO is. So some ham transceivers, very expensive ones tend to be, may have a dual VFO or two VFOs. And that feature is to permit monitoring two different frequencies simultaneously. So if we look at our rig here, we'll notice one dial here and another dial here, those are two VFOs. So you can tune to one frequency and tune to the other simultaneously and listen to both of them. You need to know this for the exam. Some HF transceivers do have dual VFOs. Vast majority of them probably do have one only. So you could only have one frequency programmed and listen to at the same time, okay? Dual VFO, however, you can listen to two frequencies simultaneously. Also, um, we need to know that there's a feature on ham transceivers called automatic level control or ALC. I think we had talked a bit about this before. But when we are doing our digital modes, and remember what we said a digital mode is, we're not using our voice to talk to the other amateur radio operator. We have a computer that is interfaced to our radio or transceiver, sometimes called our rig, our radio, of course, is connected to an antenna, but it's the computer that is generating that audio frequency shift keying signal, that AFSK signal that goes into the transceiver and then the transceiver transmit using the carrier as long, as well as that audio signal that is generated by the computer. It's not your voice that's going. That's why we call it a digital mode. It's software that's running on that computer. And we should have the automatic level control or the ALC set properly to avoid causing distortion and interference. If we don't have the ALC set properly, that signal from the computer could drive that audio too high and cause distortion. It can cause uh, spurious emissions, uh, which is not good. So we say that a transceiver's ALC system, if it is not set properly when transmitting digital mode signals or AFSK signals, and the uh, using single sideband or SSB mode, uh, that improper action of the LC can distort the signal and cause spurious emission. So that's why you need to make sure that you have your feature called the ALC set correctly on your radio. Otherwise, you can have spurious emission. So this is your signal that you want to use here. But because your ALC is not properly set on the radio, that computer is driving the audio too hard. And look, you have a spurious signal that comes out and is transmitted by your rig just because the computer is driving too hard and you're uh, driving the audio level too hard into the radio and your radio doesn't have a proper ALC setting uh, to make sure that it is controlled. So you need to use your ALC properly and the point is if you don't use it properly you can have a distorted signal and cause spurious emissions which is not good. We also need to be aware that we are again doing digital modes here. So our computer is connected to our transceiver, transceiver is connected to our antenna. That audio cable that goes between the computer and the radio to have that AFSK signal go from the radio, from the laptop, that laptop that we see here, that computer is running digital mode software, maybe WSJTX or, or what, whatever software you're using. And you have an audio cable that is letting those audio tones or so go from your computer to your radio so it can transmit them. But notice this audio cable is a cable and it could be an antenna as well and it can receive stray signals or radio frequency signals. So imagine your radio is transmitting and let's say your audio signal is not of a good quality, it's not properly shielded, it can pick up that stray RF that may be coming from your antenna or may be generated right inside the shack there, you have that stray RF around and it gets onto the audio cable and that could cause problems, right? That is called stray RF that is coming back into the audio cable and that could cause your transceiver to continue to be keyed. Even if the radio uh, is no longer receiving a signal from the computer in terms of the audio level to send a signal, 
the radio is supposed to stop transmitting, but it doesn't stop transmitting because that stray RF gets onto the audio cable. And because we are using what you call voice operated uh, operation, uh, it thinks there's an audio signal and it keeps the radio keyed or transmitting, which is not desirable at all. Imagine your radio is not supposed to be transmitting and it is transmitting all by itself because of stray RF. That is undesirable. So we say that there are some symptoms if you have RF being picked up by an audio cable that is carrying digital mode signals between the computer and the transceiver. The symptoms are the VOX, which is the voice operated exchange or switch or voice activated transmission circuit does not unkey the transmitter. What that means, sometimes when we are using our computer to key our radio or to transmit, we're telling the computer, so you can do what you call cat com control, which is computer aided uh, control that your computer actually keys the transmitter and push the talk and transmits. Or you can tell your radio, listen for when an audio signal comes from the computer and then you transmit. That is called Vox operation. When you tell your radio, listen to when there's audio and only transmit when you hear that audio, that is called voice activated transmission or Vox. Um, that's a mode of operation. Some hams like it, some don't, because it's not very deterministic. There are things that can occur that could cause your Vox, and this is one of them, stray RF and cables. So we say that the Vox does not unkey the transmitter if that stray RF is getting into the audio cable. Also, another consequence of that stray RF coming into the audio cable is that you can have your signal distorted because of that feedback coming in via RF into your audio. Also, you can have connection timeouts as a result. Because of that signal being affected, sometimes it may not get to the radio properly. Because of that stray RF coming from the antenna to your audio cable, it may disconnect and reconnect and so on. So you need to know these points for your exam as to the consequences if stray RF is picked up in the audio cables, for instance. So we come now to another um, important topic. I said we are going a little bit longer. I really would just like to couple these, uh, finish these couple of slides. We have about two or three more slides, so just bear with me. Uh, so we need to talk about linear amplifiers. So this is just some information about what a linear amplifier is. So we have our radio, our transceiver, beautiful rig here. But this rig may only put out 100 watts, 150 watts, 200 watts maybe. But sometimes I want to run 600 watts, 800 watts, Legal limit, 1,500 watts, 1 1.5 kilowatts. So I use an amplifier. So I connect my radio to my amplifier so I can drive a stronger signal to my antenna so that my signal could reach a little further. Yes? So that's my linear amplifier. So let's say I am driving 100 watts with my radio. My amplifier takes that 100 watts and it could turn it into 1,500 watts because it's an amplifier. And there are two types of amplifiers that we are using in amateur radio. One is called the vacuum tube, so that the architecture of it, inside of it, it's vacuum tubes. And the other type is solid state. Uh, so those are the two types of amplifiers, vacuum tube and solid state. And we make the point that amateur radio operators must know how to properly adjust our amplifiers. Because if we do not adjust our amplifiers properly, we can cause all sorts of problems. We can have distorted signals and we could also damage our amplifiers. So we have to make sure we adjust them. And notice here that I uh, have a little graph. This is just FYI, extra information. If you are driving your amplifier with your radio at this level of output from your radio, notice that you have uh, a commensurate amount of output from your amplifier. So this graph shows here if I'm driving only with 10 watts, this is the output I get. Maybe I get about 200 watts. If I'm driving at 30 watts, maybe I get 500 watts out. If I'm driving uh, 70 watts out from my transceiver into the amplifier, my amplifier may give me 800, 700 watts. So I can adjust my output transmit power of my radio, and that will adjust the output transmit power of my amplifier as well. And this is just a graph to show you that. So we did say that there are vacuum tube type linear amplifiers and there are also uh, solid state type. And we show here, for instance, these are electronic tubes or vacuum tubes. If you remember from our previous sessions, we showed what vacuum tubes are. You know, they are the cathode, they are the anode and so on. All right, um, those are tubes. So we are talking here about linear amplifiers that we are using to increase our transmit output power 
but it's constructed using vacuum tubes on the inside. So we have our trusty transceiver here that we are looking to use with the amplifier and the amplifier is going to our antenna. So we need to know how to adjust them. Remember we said that if we adjust it improperly, we could cause spurious emissions, we can cause distortions, we can also damage our amplifier. So we need to know how to properly adjust our amplifier. So the correct adjustment we have to make uh, to make sure we have the maximum amount of power so that it's as efficient as possible while at the same time not exceeding what we call the maximum allowable plate current and that plate current that we're talking about is the plate current on the vacuum tube so that's the first bullet point that we have here we say that making the correct adjustment for the load or coupling control of a vacuum tube rf power amplifier involves ensuring maximum output power without exceeding maximum allowable plate current. So that's what you will get in your exam. So just read that as we need to tune this uh, properly to get maximum wattage out while not exceeding the plate current. And we do have on our amplifiers, we tend to have a gauge. Notice our gauge here. It says plate current. Not sure if anyone can read it easily. And there's a gauge that shows you what that plate current is. And we need to know that maximum transmit power of our amplifier let's say it's 800 watts or 1500 watts but we need to make sure we do not exceed the maximum plate current because if we do we can damage our tube and we can damage our amplifier we also need to know that we can correctly adjust our vacuum tube based amplifier by looking at the plate current reading that gauge that's on the amplifier uh, we look at that meter and the correct adjustment as we adjust our tuning knob. So notice here we have our plate uh, current adjustment here. As we're tuning, as we're turning that, and we're looking for our maximum output power from the amplifier. But we are also looking at the plate current. And as we turn this knob and our plate current goes up, it will go up, it will go up, it will go up, it will keep going up. And then there's a little dip, it will come down. And if we continue turning again, this plate current knob, it will start to go back up. So we need to look very closely at our gauge for when that needle dips a little bit. So the needle is going up, going up, going up, going up. And as it reaches here, it dips down a little bit. And if we continue, it goes back up. So that sweet spot, that correct adjustment is when that needle does that little dip. So you need to know that for the exam. We say that for a vacuum tube RF power amplifier, the reading on the plate current meter that indicates correct adjustment of the plate tuning control is given by a pronounced dip. What we just talked about is what this bullet point means. And this is what you'll get in your exam. All right. So just about two more slides. So we have to know for our linear amplifiers, there are a couple of things or features that we need to set right or get working to have. This is our transceiver. We are introducing our linear amplifier to get a stronger signal out from our radio to our antenna. But we have to make sure we connect it right and we have to be aware of some settings and some connections to make this amplifier work well. Otherwise, we may damage it and we may cause or we may cause interference. So we have an ALC, automatic level control connection that we can make between our amplifier and our radio. And when we make that connection, it's called the ALC. It could help us reduce this distortion that could otherwise be caused because that ALC signal will limit the transmit power from our transceiver so it wouldn't distort when it gets to the amplifier. So that ALC, automatic level control, should be used with our RF amplifier to reduce distortion due to excessive, excessive drive. In other words, if the radio is driving too excess, excessively, that signal called the ALC signal to the radio will tell it, hey, brother, you're driving too hard, you know, you need to cool off, you need to back down a little bit. And the radio will say, okay, cool, no problem, let me back off to the sufficient amount. Is it good there now? And the LC will say, yeah, all right, cool. So that ALC signal, which is actually a, vol um, a signal that goes between the amplifier and the transceiver, will, will tell it where the right spot is. And when that right spot is uh, achieved, you will not have distortion due to any excessive drive. So that's a kind of control it's called the automatic level control. We also need to know for the exam that if excessive drive power is used with a solid state RF amplifier, it can lead to permanent damage in the amplifier. So if you're using a solid state linear amplifier, 
you can damage it if you drive excessively from your radio. If you have power output, let's say your radio is capable of 200 watts, but the amplifier only needs 85 watts or 100 watts or whatever for maximum, and you drive 200 watts into the amplifier, you could damage your solid state amplifier as a result. Okay? So note that. Also, there's another feature called a time delay uh, within the amplifier uh, circuit that can avoid, uh, gives it enough time for the transmit receive changeover to occur. Remember when you're transmitting from your transceiver to your amplifier and you have to go back into receive mode, that could take a little time. It's not instantaneous per se. So there's a little time delay feature which you need to know about. Um, the time, a time delay is sometimes included in a transmitter keying circuit to allow time for transmit receive changeover operations to complete properly before RF output is allowed. So in other words, you want the receive to finish before you start to transmit. Those of you who may be in the electricity sector and know about generators, you have make or break, you don't want to be transmitted on bars when you're still connected, you have to switch off before you could switch on. So it's the same concept. Before you start to transmit, you have to make sure your receive is completed because if your receive circuit is still connected and you start to transmit, <laughs> you can have problems and so on as well, right? So you need to have a little delay. So that time delay is included to help with that situation. Last slide, folks. So we came across antenna tuners before. It's not the first time, but in the general class, we need to talk about it again. And we said ad nauseum that Hamza matchmakers and we said that an antenna tuner goes between our transceiver and our antenna. But if we have an amplifier, the antenna tuner needs to come after the amplifier. So you don't put the antenna tuner between your radio and the amplifier. It comes before the antenna. That's where you put the antenna tuner. It's to tune the antenna. So don't make the mistake of putting it inside of here. You're trying to tune it. All right. So this is how you hook up an antenna tuner in the usual sense of it. Okay, so what is the antenna tuner? Remember we said that the you have 50 ohm feed line, the output impedance of your transmitter is 50 ohms, and you hope and you wish that the feed line, your, your impedance, your feed point impedance of your antenna is also 50 ohms. That sometimes is not so. Sometimes you could say it's hardly ever so if the antenna is not properly tuned or built, or if you have a multiband antenna. That impedance at the feed point may not be 50 ohms. And you don't want to damage your trans transmitter. You don't want to damage your amplifier by having a highest WR. So you want to match. You remember we said Hamza matchmakers. So we try to match this 50 ohm output impedance of the transceiver to the 50 ohm uh, feed point impedance of our antenna. And we use an antenna tuner. So it matches the transmitter output impedance. Uh, in case the output impedance, sorry, the feed point impedance of the antenna is not equal to 50, to 50 ohms. That is what our antenna tuner does. So we say that an antenna tuner is also known as an antenna coupler. So you need to be aware of that as well. It could be called an antenna coupler. And it's a type of device that is often used to match transmitter output impedance to an impedance that is not equal to 50 ohms. And this is an exam question. This is where the antenna tuner resides, and this is how it tunes up your circuit very nicely for you so that you will transmit your power to the antenna and you don't have standing waves or you don't have the transmit the power being reflected back and causing heat and damage to your amplifier or your, tran your transceiver. So to achieve that objective, you use your antenna tuner. So folks, I know we went about a 15 minutes extra on the class. I hope it was valuable just trying to you know, make our way through the material. It's quite a bit that we have to do. And we are making some really good progress that we're really trying to get through this material. And we covered some of this already in the technician class as well. So this should be not unfamiliar to many of us. So folks, thank you very much. Uh, again, persons continue to join the class and we're asking those persons to please review the technician class material as well, apart from the general class material. Um, also, uh, our next class, we are scheduled for next Friday, God's willing, the 6th of August, 2021 at 8.30 p.m., usual time. Thank you so much, everyone, for bearing with the extra time. We know we ran a little extra today, and we wish you and yours all health and strength, and be safe. Take good care, everyone. Thank you so much.
Okay, thanks a lot there, Larry. Good night as well, all the best. Adesh, take good care. God bless to you as well. You too, safe weekend. Good night as well, Sylvester. Blessings to you. Gary, good night. Yes, yes, um, try to make it interesting. Glad you enjoyed it. Take good care as well. Yeah, Adesh, have a safe weekend. Certainly welcome, Jermaine. You also be safe. Have a good weekend. Timothy, you as well. Thanks very much. Have a good weekend. Okay, Ramzan, have a good night as well. You're certainly welcome. Okay, Natasha, good night. Saw you there earlier. Okay, John, good evening. Great to have you inside there also. Paula, yes, good night too. Yep. All the best. Roger, you too. Have a good night. Yes, long weekend and happy Emancipation Day. Um, public holiday uh, is, uh, well, we have the Emancipation Day in Trinidad and Tobago on Sunday and the public holiday is on, on the Monday. So please, everyone, be safe for the long weekend here. Desi, you too. Have a good night. <laughs> we'll try to do. Take good care. All the best, Desi. Okay, Anthony. Yes, indeed, it was a marathon session. Glad you liked it. Thank you so much for the feedback. Take good care. Blessings. Have a good night.